Okay. So, hey, man, I'm excited for several reasons uh, to preach Psalm 27, but you know what else I'm especially excited about today? Curtis and Kiva Gilmore are back in the house. Let's give them a hand. Isn't that awesome? And so I've asked Kiva to come up and read the scripture for us because Curtis is a little bit busy with CJ, best looking baby in town, and also because Kiva is prettier. So anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, have Kiva to read the scripture for us this morning. And give me just a second. Can you hear me? Okay. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing, I have, one thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide, hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Thank you. Job. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Wow. And he's awake now. Look at that. How cool. Very good. Very good. Um, thank you, Kiva, for reading that for us. And I'm enjoying this study in the Psalms. And one of the things we've learned about the Psalms is that all of the Bible speaks to us about God, but the Psalms speak to God about us. It is a really genuine way to give your heartfelt feelings, emotions, your conflicts, your depression, your anxieties, everything that you're experiencing, a way of reading it to God. And I, let me just tell you, if you ever go through a drought in your prayer life, where you just feel like they're bouncing off the ceiling, or you're just... And then, you know, I'm assuming you're praying. Some of you may not have learned how to pray yet, and that's fine too. But when you get to that point where you really don't know what to pray, open up the Psalms. Just start praying them to God and watch what he does. Um, last week, we talked about Psalm 24. And it's interesting because David is talking about opening up the temple doors. And one thing that I probably didn't make very clear that I should have is the temple hadn't been built yet. Do you remember that? Okay, so what is David talking about when he's talking about the temple doors? Well, let me let this video explain it to you, and it'll give a good context for last week with the temple doors and for this week about the temple and the tabernacle. We've been talking about poetry in the Bible, how biblical poets love design and masterfully use metaphor and symbolism. These poems invite us into an experience to ponder ideas slowly and from many angles. And the largest collection of poetry in the Bible is the book of Psalms. So that's what we're gonna look at here. Now the Israelites composed lots of poetry throughout their history. Yeah, poems were written by Israelites, sages, kings, and prophets. Some poems were sung by choirs in the Jerusalem temple, while others were prayed by families at home. And over the centuries, the most important and widely read poems were compiled together to be read or sung on special occasions. And I'm familiar with books of poetry, a large collection of the greatest poems in one place, and I can read through and pick my favorites. But the Book of Psalms isn't that kind of collection. 
Here, each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is for a reason, to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. The Psalms poetically retell the entire biblical story and they invite you into a literary temple. A literary temple? Yeah, so the tabernacle and then later the temple in Jerusalem were where ancient Israelites went to meet with God. When you arrived, you would see art and imagery everywhere. You'd see priests performing rituals. You'd hear songs and prayers, all of it symbolically proclaiming that your God rules the world from this mountain and you're in his living room. So the temple was a place to be in God's presence and also to immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom. Exactly. And so try to imagine how traumatic it was when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, plundered and burned the temple, and then took many Israelites into exile. Yeah, where can they go now to meet with God, to sing their story and say their prayers? That's where the book of Psalms comes in. It's a prayer book for exiles designed as a virtual temple. You enter the Psalms to meet with God and to hear the entire biblical story of God's kingdom sung back to you in poetry. Cool, but how does the Psalms do it? Let's start with the book's design. There are 150 poems broken up into five clear sections. At the beginning, there's been placed a short introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which lay out the main themes of the whole book by reviewing the biblical storyline. Okay. Psalm 1 looks back to the Garden of Eden and its river of life. Yeah, God placed humanity in a garden temple. And here, humans decide to define good and evil on their own terms, and so are exiled from the garden. But the first psalm paints a portrait of hope, about an upright human who delights in God's wisdom, which is called Torah, or instruction. This person is like the tree of life in the garden temple. They eternally blossom because they're planted in the river of God's life. Yeah, that's beautiful, but who's it supposed to be? Well, remember that story in Genesis? After humanity's foolish rebellion, God made a promise. Oh right, a future human, the seed of the woman who would come and defeat evil and restore the world. And that's what Psalm 2 is about. God's promise that a king would come from the line of David. He's called the Son of God and the Messiah. God appoints him to bring justice on human evil and to restore God's kingdom and peace over the nations. So Psalms 1 and 2 introduce all these main themes. Yes, and then the book develops those themes through the five sections. The first two explore the complicated story of David and his royal family. The third section focuses on the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's royal line. But then the fourth and fifth sections rekindle the hope for the Messiah, a new temple, and God's kingdom on the other side of the exile. Then the book ends with a five-part conclusion, praising God for his faithfulness. Cool. Now, nearly half of the Psalms are connected to one guy, King David, who God chose to rule Israel. Yes, David's story is really important in this book. He experienced many times of hardship, but he trusted God with radical faith. And in these poems, David shares his fears, confesses his failures, and offers thanks to his Redeemer. And he's constantly speaking of a deep longing to be in God's presence in the temple. But wait, David lived before the temple was even built. Exactly. This portrait of David, hoping and praying for God's kingdom and a future temple, it resembles the hopes of the later generations of the exiles. And so David's prayers could become theirs as well. David's like a prayer coach, giving us words for how to pray and how to discover God's presence in good times and bad. Exactly. There are 73 poems connected to David, but most of the rest come from later generations of biblical poets, and they have learned to pray and hope like David. And so the end result is the Book of Psalms, designed as a virtual temple for all generations of God's people. This isn't a kind of book you just read once and put down. No, it's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflection. These prayers and laments and songs of praise are meant to become our own. They're poems for exiles who are learning to live by God's wisdom and to seek God's justice in the world as they hope for the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God. Amen. Hope that was helpful. So you have Adam and Eve in the Garden Temple, okay? And then as Israel's roaming in the wilderness, you got the tabernacle. These are each places where God's glory meets with God's people. So then David wants to build a tabernacle or a temple, but God says, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. I'll let you lay out the plans, gather all the supplies, but Solomon's going to build the temple. And so the temple is built, because then it's destroyed, then it's rebuilt in Jesus' era, and then it's destroyed again. 
And of course, then Paul says to the church, you are the temple, that each one of you as members are a stone stacking up together to build God's temple where God's glory will meet with God's people. But then he also says in 1 Corinthians that your bodies are what? The temple. And remember how God's presence was often displayed by a pillar of fire or smoke or whatever? So what happened at Pentecost? A clove of fire over each individual marking God's presence is over me. That each believer individually, their body was a temple and God met with them there. So no matter where you are in the world, you can worship God and be in God's presence because the Holy Spirit does what? Dwells inside you. You read over and over in the Old Testament how the Holy Spirit came upon Samson, how the Holy Spirit came upon David. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people, but in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit lives within people. And so you could say we have an advantage over Old Testament saints, if you will, but that doesn't, that doesn't indicate gaining or losing salvation. It's just talking about the way the Holy Spirit of God operates. So hopefully that's helpful to give some context to Psalm 27 today. And what you're going to see here is David is like maybe bipolar or something's going on here because he starts off with a bang, just super confident and just super into it. And then all of a sudden he just crashes in the middle of like, man, God, don't forsake me. Don't leave me. Don't be angry against me forever. But then he comes right back out of it. And before we get too hard on David, we've all been that way, okay? I, I have my ups and downs, and I don't consider myself a very emotional person, but I just, it seems like I just have ups and downs, and, and the only thing that gets me through it is just the promises of God's word, that I claim God's promises so much that God's promises begin to claim me, and that you work your way through the scriptures here. And it reminds me of, there was a doctor that was visiting patients in a mental hospital, and he comes to one room where there's two patients that share the room and they're each on their bed. And he goes up to one of the patients. He said, hi, I, I, I'm Dr. Lanier. He said, uh, what's your name? He goes, I'm Napoleon. He goes, oh, you're, you're Napoleon. Okay, um, the Napoleon. He said, yeah. He said, um, who told you you're Napoleon? He, he said, God did. And the other patient goes, I did not. <laughs> anyway, that's my joke for today. Anyway. David reminds me of me when he's so up and down that he's just not whether questions whether or not he's emotionally stable. But what the Psalms do is they bring stability. They let you, God gives you the prerogative to just empty it all out. You're not going to hurt God's feelings. You know that? If you say, God, I don't think you even care. I wonder if you're even there. I'm not trying to rhyme here. But if it just, you just go on with your complaints. God's a big guy. He can handle it. As long as God doesn't want perfect prayers, he wants honest prayers. And that's what the Psalms give us. And David really lays it out there. And he starts off with, the Lord is my light. And you, you know, when not, many of you have been around the Bible enough to, you know, when you see the word Lord in all upper caps, it's Yahweh or sometimes transliterated Jehovah. It means the all-sufficient one. The God who has everything and is everything is the one who is my light. Okay? So you need to realize there's nothing you need that God cannot give you. If you need more money, God's capable. If God's not giving you all that you want, it may be for a very good reason, just like you don't give a 16-year-old a new Corvette, okay? You may be asking for something that God's saying, whoa, whoa, you're not ready for that. But God is all-sufficient, and he can supply all your needs. But let's move past physical needs. He provides all of your emotional needs. Many times we put that burden on another human being. We want our kids to fulfill our happiness. We want our spouse to fulfill all of our happiness and our joy. And what we do is we get upset with them because we say, they're not meeting my needs. Guess what? They weren't designed to. They are not, there's no human being that will meet all your needs. So if you're still looking for the right guy, it's, his name is Jesus, okay? <laughs> Find him, and then that guy you're living with or married to or whatever will look a whole lot better because you found Jesus and you're not putting all the weight of a creator on another human being, a wife or a mother or parents. If you're, if you're trying to please your parents, you're still looking for mom to say, you're a good kid, you know, and you're 40 years old. If you're still looking for that, just stop. Get your approval, get your emotional satisfaction and fulfillment from Jesus. And everybody else is like, oh, that's, that's great. Whatever you give me is, is bonus, is icing on the cake. Notice it says the Lord is my light and my salvation. 
we all go through dark times. Uh, you've been there. I've been there. You know, I've, I'm texted out that, that this is one of my favorite, if not my, the favorite psalm. And there was a time in my life, you know, 18 years or so ago, that I was just so down and depressed and so discouraged, just thought that God had totally forsaken me, that the only thing that got me through was getting on my knees and reading the psalms, especially this one, Psalm 16 and 27. I'd go back between 16 and 27 over and over again. Reading them out loud was the only relief I got from the anxiety. I felt like I was going to have a nervous breakdown. And if you know me, I'm a pretty chill, laid-back person. So for me to be going through that, it was pretty traumatic. And so I was in like a dark place, and God was the light that shone in the darkness. And literally, there was times I would read the psalm and be like, oh, I feel better. Get up, walk into the kitchen, and all of a sudden, that cloud would come over me again. I'd be like, oh, what am I going to do? And I'd go literally right back to the couch, get on my knees, open up the psalm again, and read it again. Sometimes six, seven, eight times a day. I know, it sounds crazy, but you've been there, some of you. And if you're not there, you will be. You know, and I'm not trying to prophesy doom over your life. I'm just saying that's life. Life stinks at times, and we will all go through dark times. And so it's good to know that God, and here, what's really interesting, it doesn't say God gives me light. It says God is my light. Jesus said, I am the, what, light of the world. And here's the thing. It says that light shone into the world, and the, and, and the world rejected it because men love darkness rather than light. Some people love their darkness. And it says the reason why they love darkness is because, because their deeds were evil. So darkness is referring to a dark lifestyle. And so people will choose that over the light of God. But also darkness can also refer to like the depression and things like that. And you ever met some people who would like to play the victim? Maybe you're that way. You know, I, I know someone who, and you, you don't know who I'm talking about, so don't try to guess. But, uh, you know, they were hurt by their husband being unfaithful, and this is forever ago. And yet this person will talk about him leaving her for another woman like it was yesterday. And we're talking decades. And they are, they are identified as the divorced, spurned wife. That's their identity, and they cherish it. Because as long as they're the victim, they're not responsible for their behavior. They're not responsible. It's his fault. It's not mine. Some people love darkness rather than light. You know, God doesn't want you to stay in the darkness. It also says, he is my light and my salvation. Okay? Um, what's interesting about this is, hold on for a second. Now it's going to ask for face ID. Here we go. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the word salvation comes, is the, at the root of Jesus' name. Jesus' name means Jehovah or Yahweh is my salvation. And in this context, it means deliverer. And, and salvation means delivered from various different things. And Jesus also said that, what, I am the light of the world, which I've, I've already covered. But what he's saying here is the Lord present tense is my salvation. It's not like God's going to save me someday. God's going to get delivered from this trouble. God's going to deliver me from this darkness. No, God already is your hope of getting out of the situation. Present tense. And see, what many of us don't realize is we look at the valley of the shadow of death and say, man, would you get me out of this? And that's not what David prayed. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, in the midst of the valley I will fear no evil because you are with me. With me where? In the dark valley. Understand that God takes us through valleys for a reason. He is just as much there in the valley as he is on the mountaintop. He's just as much there in the darkness as he is on the sunrise and the sunset. So don't say, well, man, someday I'll be out of this and then I'll feel like God has saved me. No, he's saving you in the valley. Cherish the valley while it's, while it's there. And there's, let me remind you uh, uh, that one of the healths of a, mar uh, we've been studying one of the healths of a, one of the marks, nine marks of a healthy church is good biblical theology. Understand that there are, this is where most Christian religions get way off track because they don't understand what I'm about to show you. And some of you have seen this before. There are three aspects of salvation. When the Bible talks about God delivering you, saving you, redeeming you, he could be talking about three different things. And, it, and the way you understand any verse in the Bible is what? Put it in its proper context. Context is everything. When a preacher pulls a verse out of context to prove a point, that's dangerous. Know what the context means in that passage. So, 
2 Corinthians, spell this out. This isn't just me making it up or superimposing some theological grid on the Bible. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 10, Jesus, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. What three tenses do you see in that verse? Past, present, and future. It's all right there. Am I making this up? No. Okay. So when it says Jesus delivered us from something in the past, it's talking about the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Good job. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. How many of you can say amen to Jesus save me from the penalty of sin? Amen. So that's happened in the past. When you got saved then, all your sins, past, present, and future, are gone. You've been saved. Past tense, right? But then, Jesus is not just your Savior of all the things of the past. He can deliver you through the dark valley in the present. Isn't that good to know? So it says he still does deliver us. He is your Savior through economic trouble, through physical trouble, through marital trouble. You name your problem. Jesus can be your Savior, your Deliverer, present tense. Not that you're being born again, again. You're being delivered from another set of problems. And then future tense that someday he will yet deliver us. Like Paul told the Thessalonian church, he said that we will be saved from the wrath that is to come through him. That's why I believe we Christians will not go through the tribulation. That's the wrath of God being poured out on lost mankind. That's why Jesus will come and take his church out of the world. And we'll be saved from the wrath that is to come. Future tense. So what, basically what you're seeing here is salvation from sin's power, salvation from sin's, I'm sorry, salvation from sin's penalty, salvation from sin's power, salvation from sin's presence. They all begin with the letter P, so it keeps easy to remember. So the wages of sin is death, that's sin's penalty. Paul prayed in Romans chapter 7, he said, you know, the good I want to do, man, I can't do it. And those things I keep saying, I'm not going to do it ever again, guess what, I go right back to it. And is Paul saying this while he's lost? No, he's saved. And then he says, who shall deliver me or save me from this bondage? He said, I thank my God through my Lord Jesus Christ. He's not saying I have to get saved again. He's saying the only way I'm going to get victory over sin is for him to presently deliver me and to be my Savior, be my light and my salvation. And then someday we'll be delivered from the wrath that is to come when Jesus returns. So the Lord, present tense, is my light and my salvation. So the three aspects of salvation right there in that passage, penalty, power, and presence. Which one is David praying right now? He's praying about sin's power. David's not asking to be born again. He's not asking to be raptured out of the world. He's asking for salvation in the, what he's going through. And let's remind ourselves what David was going through. What's happening right now in his life? Well, on this particular, on Psalm 24, we're pretty sure it was Absalom. In this one, it may be Saul or it may be Absalom, but either way, someone who doesn't like him is wanting to kill him. And not just one individual, the, the army of a whole nation is after him. Now, David does have a band of loyal followers who are with him. We don't know. So at any given time, it changes. Sometimes it's just a dozen men, and sometimes it's a couple hundred. And then sometimes David is absolutely by himself. Like he says, hey, guys, I don't want to pull you into this. I'm going to go into the city, and I'm going to act like a crazy guy, and I'm going to hang out there. Okay? And so many times David went out there by himself. So at any given time, somebody is wanting to kill him. Anybody in here, somebody, you have someone out to kill you? Anybody? Okay. So I don't think any of us are going through what David's going through. So if David can pray this psalm with confidence, you can with whatever you may be going through. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Everybody say my. You see, this this psalm means something when it becomes personal. You don't just say, well, yeah, God is a light and God's a savior. And God's a stronghold. No, you got to make it personal. If you emotionally want to get out of the dump you're in or get over the anxiety you're feeling about whatever's stressing you out, you've got to claim these personally. You've got to talk to God and say, God, you are my light. I believe that you're going to shine in this darkness. You are my strength. I'm not depending on my husband. I'm not depending on my wife for emotional support. I'm not depending on any other human being more than I'm depending 
on you to get me through this. And we've got to make it personal for it to be efficacious. How about that word? Number, verse number, it says to here, whom shall I fear? I want to know, what are you afraid of this morning? And notice he says whom. I, I believe every word of God is placed there on purpose. He doesn't say, what am I afraid of? He says, whom shall I fear? Who are you afraid of? You fear in the rejection of someone again? Are you afraid of someone firing you? Afraid of someone talking trash about you? Who are you afraid of? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. And then the, the, the subsequent question to that is why? Why do I care what they think? Really? Why? You've got to answer that question. Is my self-esteem so wrapped up in other people's opinions that, that, that an insult from them or rejection from them makes me feel insecure? Some, some, of you, some of us are insecure texters. You text somebody a question, and if they don't reply within 15 minute, milliseconds, they don't like me? Are, are they mad at me? And then here's the most annoying text in the world, the question mark. I hate, don't do that to me, okay? I, I, I will stop, I will block you. I, <laughs> I will block you in a heartbeat. I, I, will, I will throw my phone down and stomp on it like I'm never texting that person again. So I think that's, anyway, other people read it differently, but it's like they'll send you a question, and seriously, you don't answer within five minutes because, you know, you have a life. You actually do talk to other people. You actually do put your phone down, and you don't have it in front of your face 24-7. And, and then all of a sudden, you don't answer them within five minutes. They, they send you the question mark. And, and you know what? I, don't, I can't speak for everybody, but I think for a lot of people, it's like, oh, my gosh, are they mad at me? Why are they not texting me? Why are you not answering me? And then all of a sudden, they, then they send three question marks and all of this stuff. And oh my gosh. Anyway, what are you afraid of? Is your self esteem really wrapped up in what other people think? There's a book that you ought, you ought to check it out. It's called What Do Other People Think of Me and Why Do I Care? Really good book. You ought to check that out. But and then he says, Of whom shall I be afraid? So again, he's identifying a person with this. And usually, nine times out of ten, our anxieties are caused not by circumstances, although those, we have those. They're caused by people. And even sometimes the circumstances that we dread, we dread those because of the fallout that will happen with other people because of the circumstances. Are you with me? So in each case, he, said, he has an answer for that. He says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. So now it's a rhetorical question. If God's my light and my salvation, what do you matter? I mean, really, am I going to get mad because someone at the store gave me a look or was rude to me or a waitress didn't give me the best service? Is that really going to ruin my day? If the Lord's my light and my salvation, why should I fear them? And if the Lord is my stronghold, which means a fortress that you go inside to hide, if I'm hidden in Jesus Christ and secure in him, why do I care if someone texts me something or said some talk smack on Facebook or talk, you know, said something bad on social media? Does that really going to shake me if, if the Lord is my stronghold? Here's a picture of a stronghold. This is actual David's uh, tower, and it's a fortress that, that, that what's left of it over there in Jerusalem. You can see it's a modern-day picture. There's lights on and all that. Um, but imagine if you were inside this and an army's trying to attack you. I think you're doing pretty good, wouldn't you say? And really, David says over and over again that the Lord is my refuge and my stronghold, and those who run therein shall be safe. So you picture you're outside these city walls and armies chasing you. You know, you got one sword. They've got 100 guys with swords. But you run in there, and you, as you're running towards the gates, hey, open the gates, open the gates. And they open the gates, and you run in, and they slam the gates shut and pick the, put the big bar down. All those other guys are outside going, oh, darn. And you're safe inside, not because you're stronger than that army, but because where you're located at. And if you're in Christ, you're in the stronghold. He says, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. So David is seeing, you know how Stephen Covey talks about seven habits of highly effective men? I mean, highly effective, what? People? There's several different ones, but anyway. Um, he talks about begin with the end in mind. It's a biblical premise, not that Stephen Covey has good biblical theology because he doesn't. Um, but he did stumble across this one thing that if you begin with the end of mind, if you think to the very end, I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus for a billion years, 
Okay, I don't know if that's a word. I just made that up. A billion years. What can they do to me right now? The worst they can do to me is kill me and I go to heaven. Okay, so if you talk bad about me, you don't like me, you fire me, you divorce me, whatever, I'm thinking about that. But I even, even then, also, God is the one who keeps score, right? He's the one that's going to take care of you. I'm, I don't have to worry about taking care of you and worry about justice. So if you think of those things, it's, it's, it's going to be that person that stumbles and falls. 2 Samuel 22:31 says, This God, his way is perfect, for the word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. You know that in the end, God is going to take care of you. He will take care of them. It's not your job. You don't have to worry and stress over it. Because Paul says in Romans 12, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. It's not your job to get revenge. It's not your job to say, well, they did this, so I'm going to do this. Okay? But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says who? The Lord. So when someone at work is spreading lies about you, gossiping about you, out for your job, trying to compete with you for a promotion or whatever it may be, you don't have to counterbalance what they've said. Okay? Rick Warren, we just went through his series of 50 Days of Transformation. He's probably one of the most criticized pastors in the world, and he never defends himself. He never says, oh, no, I didn't say that, or you took that verse out, you took that out of context, or no, I didn't do this. And people, you, just go to YouTube and watch how people will trash Rick Warren and say he's everything from the Antichrist to the false prophet to, you know, a, a false gospel and all that stuff. And all he does is preach the gospel and tens of thousands of people. He's, he's literally changing the world single-handedly. And uh, people will criticize him, and he says, I, I never defend myself. The Lord is my defender. That takes faith. Because, man, when someone says something that's not true to you, you want to go and tell everybody, hey, just for the record, I just want you to know that what they said was not true, and here's the truth, blah, blah, blah. And we feel, can you keep up with that? No. It's, it's like the old adage, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth even gets its boots on in the morning. You know, you can try to go around and try to spread the truth. It's not, you're not going to keep up with it. You know, you can just... When somebody said something about me a few years ago that was so untrue. And someone came to me and said, hey, I heard this, whatever. I said, okay, so do you believe that? And they're like, no, I don't believe that at all. I'm like, okay. I didn't even go into the whole details. It was just, it was just a fallacious lie. And, and, and I, I don't, let just stand for itself because my reputation will either stand for itself or you can believe what you want to believe. But people will do that, but you've got to trust God and not take it into your hand, own hands to get revenge. He says... Though an army encamp against me. And he's not talking hypothetical. (laughs) He has armies that are camping out to find him. He says, my heart shall not fear. Notice he didn't say, my mind will not fear. Or He's talking about this in the center of his being, where his will and volition is, where he chooses to worship God, that's where he's not going to fear. He's making the conscious choice. And some of you suffer from anxiety or some of you are borderline with it or whatever. And every day you've got to make a choice. My heart will not fear. It's not just a good positive thing you say to yourself or put on a sticky note. But it's based on the word of God. I'm not opposed to sticky notes. Those are great things. Put them all over your mirror. But put scriptures all over your mirror. Because it's not just some power of positive thinking that's going to get you through. It's the power of God's word and the positivity that it gives that you will choose for your heart not to fear. So what do you fear? We often fear about our health. You know, you have a doctor's appointment coming up and you're stressing. Is this going to be cancer? Is this going to, they're going to find something. Am I not going to be in remission anymore? Um, you know, whatever. And you, you start stressing about your health. And those are legitimate concerns. We often stress a lot about money. How much money do you think David has right now? <laughs> about maybe a sword that's worth a pretty good amount of money and not much else. Um, but we stress about money a lot. And Jesus says, you know what? Consider the birds of the field. The birds of the air, the flowers of the field. Do they stress? And yet your heavenly Father provides all that they need. You really believe, do you really, really believe that God will provide? I don't think CJ, as he grows up, is going to be, man, is there anything to eat in this house today? I wonder if I'm going to be able to eat today. Man, 
Are there any, what am I going to wear? I don't think he's going to be worried because he's going to be so well taken care of. He's, he's going to wake up every morning. So of course there's going to be eggs and sausage you know, on the table. Of course, of course there's going to be all these things going to be taken care of. It's funny, when he gets to be 18, 19, 20 years old, he's going to start stressing about it. And yet he still has the same mom and dad. But because he's feeling more independence, like this is my life, that's when he starts stressing. When you start feeling like you're independent and you've got this on your own, that's when you start stressing. But what does Paul tell us over and over again, and especially in, in John's letters, 1 John, that you are little children. God, even though you're, you may have been saved for 40 years, God still wants you to, you to see yourself as a little child, to totally dependent upon your heavenly father. Another thing we stress about is family. You know, we have, we have some kids in our family that are going through some difficult times. And you want to worry for them. But what would you say is the solution for a 21-year-old or a 32-year-old or whatever age you have that's gone astray? What is the best thing you can do for them? Pray. And who are you praying to? Praying to God. It's in his hands, okay? we got to leave those to God. We can't stress over those things. But I think probably one of the biggest things we worry about is what other people think what other people think. And we, we try to be proactive on that by impressing people. We try, we try the humble brag. <laughs> we do all kinds of things. We post all kinds of pictures. We want people to like them. So we're, we're running out all kinds of forerunners in our life to make people like us in advance because we're feeling very insecure about that. But Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man lays a snare. What, what is a snare? It's a trap. And this particular type of one is like ones that they would hang amongst trees in the forest. And the lines of it would be so thin that birds couldn't see it. So a bird flying through the forest, forest would, would f- fly into this snare. And then it would pull down the, the, the lines from the trees and wrap them up. And the more the, the bird struggled, the more it was entangled. And picture a bird on the ground, not flying anymore, struggling in this snare. That is, the more he struggles, the more it's wrapping up in him. And the more you struggle with what people think about you, the worse it gets. It's just a trap. You've got to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, God loves this guy right here. <laughs> I know it sounds cheesy, but you've got to read God's word and say, God loves me so much. He adopted me to be his child. I have nothing to worry about. I have eternity with Jesus Christ. And the same, not only am I saved in the past, not only will I be saved in the future, I am saved today from all the powers of sin against me. And so you know what fear is? Here's a great definition of fear. False evidence appearing real. You're believing lies. People are saying things about you, and you start, well, maybe I am that ugly. Maybe I am that stupid. Maybe nobody loves me. Maybe nobody will marry me. Whatever it may be, maybe somehow I am just trash. It's been kicked to the curb. And that's all false evidence that appears to be real when it's not the truth. The truth is in God's word. And let me tell you something. When people come to me for counseling and they're struggling with depression, anxiety, whatever, I'll ask them, how much time are you spending in the word? And there is a direct proportion between their depression and anxiety and how much time they're spending in the word. Almost every single time. Oh, I don't read it every day. Okay, so you don't read it every day, but you're wanting to get out of this trouble every day, aren't you? You know, how shall we be saved if we neglect so great a salvation? If we neglect God's word and the hope and assurance, it's there. He says, my heart shall not fear through the war arise against me. And again, for us, this is a metaphor. For David, it's, it's, it's reality. He says, and yet I will be confident. This is not a fleshly confidence. This is not an ego confidence. This is, oh, because I'm a great warrior, because I've killed tens of thousands of people. Man, I fought a guy that's nine and a half feet tall. I took him down. Is that where his confidence comes from? His confidence is in the Lord. And don't you forget that. That's, that's where it comes from. And then he says, one thing have I asked of the Lord. It's interesting. Here David is to saying, hey, God, just give me one thing. Did you know what's, so I, I, when I was studying for this, I didn't realize this and put the two and two together. As many times I've read Psalm 27, God came to David's son Solomon and said, hey, one thing, whatever you want, ask for it. Solomon asked, and everybody will say Solomon asked for, yeah, he didn't. 
He asked for an understanding heart. And the Bible says that God gave him an understanding heart and wisdom. David, Solomon asked for an understanding heart. God gave him wisdom on top of an understanding heart. He knew in order to have an understanding heart to rule God's people, you need wisdom. So God didn't give him what he asked for. He gave him more than what he asked for. Isn't that cool? And when you pray, give God that blank check. You can ask for something, but God, if you have something better in mind, I'll take it. Okay? And, and that's what, that's what, and so David here is praying for one thing. And it's not for wisdom. He says that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And again, the house of the Lord had not been built yet. He's talking about the spiritual house of the Lord, experiencing the presence of God wherever he is, whether it's in the tabernacle or in the forest or in a cave, he wants to be in the house of God because God's presence comes to him. And what's interesting, he says, I'm going to ask it, but then I'm going to seek after it. Many people will ask God for something, but then not seek it. Why hasn't God answered my prayer yet? Because you're not looking for it. You're not going after and seeking it. And the word seek here could also be translated pursue. What does Jesus say? Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Which those conveniently spell ask, A-S-K. Ask, seek, and knock. And he's saying you've got to be persistent. You can't say, God, give me a job, give me a job, give me, give me, give me a job. And then you don't go out and you seek a job. You don't say, God, give me a wife, give me a wife, give me a wife, and then you sit home and play video games. Just saying, just saying. Okay, Charles, it didn't happen that way, did it? Right? You have to go to gym to get your wife. That's right. Hold, if you want to hear the story behind that, see Charles after church. Right? And he didn't meet Amanda there. Anyway, um, he said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's why I'm thankful Chris picked that song, The Beauty of the Lord. Like I said, I've been saved since I was nine, and I've always been learning about Jesus. And then here, 46 years later, I feel like I'm just understanding the beauty of Jesus. Tammy's something to behold. I, I call her good looking, SGL. Right? So good looking. Has other meanings, but it's S SGL. Anyway, um, and you know, you, you look at someone who's beautiful, you just want to just stare at them, you know? Or you see a beautiful sunset or sunrise or a forest, or whatever, and you just look at it, and you just, you just want to stare at it. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. And now, we can't do that physically right now, but we can do it in an even more supernatural way than our physical eyes. We behold him in the word. And what I want to encourage you to do is, when you read the word this week, I want you to read it in a different way than you ever have before. I want you to read looking for the beauty of Jesus. How beautiful, and you know, it's interesting. When I met Tammy, she had this phrase that I didn't understand. When one of the kids would misbehave, oh, you're being ugly. I'm like, you just call her kid ugly? Man. And, but what she meant was ugly on the inside. Oh, that's ugly. Don't do that. That's bad behavior, which it teaches kids the importance of. It's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. And right on the inside, you're acting ugly. And so the more we understand Jesus' heart, the more we behold his beauty. And the more that we see how he, um, how beautiful he is. And when you read the word that you should be looking for is the beauty of the Lord. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord. He's asking for that one thing. What is your one thing? For many of you, it's like, oh, God, please, a better job, a better job. Okay, let's say you get the better job. Are you happy now? Do you realize whether you get the better job or you're stuck with the same horrible job, if you behold the beauty of Jesus, that's the one thing you really need. What's the one thing you're seeking after? He says, the house of the Lord, we talked about the temple, and the gaze upon his beauty. So why do we study God's word? Well, we often study it to get knowledge. That's a good thing. You should want to know more about God. We often will study it to get salvation. We, we want to know that we're saved, not only for sin's penalty, but sin's power. We want, to, we want to experience that salvation, that deliverance. A lot of times we go to the Bible to get comfort. I don't feel good. I'm depressed. I'm stressed, and so we read the scriptures to get comfort. A lot of times we'll, we're like, I don't really want to do. What college should I go to? Should I take this job? Should I not take this job? And we want to get direction in life. But let me challenge you to read God's word for one purpose and one purpose only, to fall in love with Jesus. If, if you walk away from your 15-minute devotion and you version and you don't, if you don't feel more in love with Jesus, go back and start over. You've missed something. 
pray before you read the scriptures. When I was young, I was taught to pray the prayer of David where God opened my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your word. And so I, most oftentimes I'll pray that before I even open up the scriptures. God, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your word. And then as you're reading, God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to show me? And not just so, so I can do, have a better day, so I can be more successful, so that my wife will love me more. No, so that I can behold your beauty. Because when you behold the beauty of Jesus, everything else in life falls into place. It says, for he will hide me, conceal me, and lift me. This is, again, the picture in his little Trinitarian way of showing this metaphor of the fortress up on a rock. You're hiding in the fortress. The doors of the fortress are shut. You're concealed. And where is this fortress located up? High upon a rock. Because, you know, in battle, they talk about taking the high ground. When, when in, like, even if you've studied Civil War history, it was all about certain hills. And if you could take that hill, you had an advantage because that means you're fighting downhill and they're fighting an uphill battle. You ever heard that phrase, fighting an uphill battle? You fight against someone with a bayonet and they're uphill and, and you're, go, you're going uphill and they're coming downhill at you, who has the advantage? So when you're lifted up upon a rock in a fortress and you're hidden there and you're concealed there, I think you're pretty safe. And that's, that's the confidence that David feels, not again because of his own abilities. He says, now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy and I will sing and make melody to the Lord. I could spend a lot of time on this, but we've learned in previous months that the sacrifices of God for us in the New Testament are the lips of our praise and our bodies. Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, what, present yourselves, your bodies, a living Say it. sacrifice. And, then what is, and we also give the sacrifice of our lips of praise. And let me just make this, and this is going to sound like an a, uh, in-your-face comment and like stepping over the line, but I think I have biblical reason. If on Sunday morning you don't sing, your heart's not right. Period. Say, oh, Gary, I don't sing. My heart's right. I, I'll, I'll beg to differ with you. I, I challenge you to read the Psalms and see how David can't help but sing. And I used to be one of those guys. When I was a pastor, when I was pastor in First Baptist Church in Clute, and there's 400 people out there singing, I would be standing there just going, and I would not be singing. I, would, I kind of enjoyed everybody else singing. I kind of was just thinking, this, whenever this is over, I'm going to get up and preach. Just saying. It wasn't until God broke me and where I had nothing but Jesus that I couldn't help but sing. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay? If you want to argue with me about that, we can, we can go at it afterwards. Okay. He says, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. Guess what? My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. I love that verse right there. Just God says, you do it. And he says, okay, I'll do it. You say jump, I'll say, you say jump, I'll say how high. He says, hide not your face. Now, here's where he goes down. And I'm not going to, I wonder, I purposely spent the majority of time on the first few verses so I could run through the rest. But he goes down. He's like, oh, God, please don't hide your face from me. Please don't turn away from me. You know, you have been my help in the past. Don't cast me off. Forsake me not. Now, he's not saying this because, um, he doesn't think it's a possibility. For some reason, David thinks this is a possibility. Don't know why. Usually, I think this because I've sinned against God. I think God's going to turn his back on me. But then he, he reassures himself. Watch how he progresses through this. He said, for my father and mother have forsaken me. Now, we don't know anything in the biblical account whether David's parents are alive or dead. So, again, the only way I can interpret this is in the context. And it, I'll take it literally. Now, whether his mom and dad have said, we don't want anything to do with you, or what I believe is they're dead. Mom and dad have forsaken me. Here's why. But the Lord will take me in. Take me in is a phrase used for orphans. I think David's an orphan. He's an adult, but I think his parents have deceased. Because, you know, you, you've heard people say that phrase. Well, you know, my mom and dad have passed, but the, this family took me in. It's not like they came over for dinner one night. It means they took me in. I lived there from then on. Okay, so that context tells me mom and dad are dead. And even though my mom and dad are dead, the people who love me most. So anybody loves you more than your mom and dad? 
I mean, supposed to. Your mom and dad are supposed to be people who love you more than anybody. If even the people who love me the very most say goodbye, I'm okay because the Lord's going to take me in. I'm going to live in the house of the Lord forever. All right. And then he says, teach me your way. We don't do the way of God naturally. It, it, it'd be like plumbing with me. I have no clue. If, you, if I'm going to fix the sink, somebody's got to show me how to do it. And that's, that plumbing is as foreign to me as doing God's way is to all of us. We think we know God's way, but we really have to be taught God's way. He says, give me a nod up to the will of my adversaries for false witnesses have heard against me, and they breathe out violence. This is one of the many, many, many psalms that are quoted in the New Testament in reference to Jesus on the cross. You see, Jesus was given up to his adversaries so that you wouldn't have to be. Jesus was forsaken so that you would not be forsaken by God. Jesus had false witnesses speak against, speak lies against them so that you could experience the truth. Here's where we see the gospel in this Psalms. And Jesus experienced the most horrific violence so that you would not have to go through the, the ultimate violence, and that's eternity in hell. Jesus went through all of that for us. And then he says this, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Basically what David's saying here, and again, Jesus is also saying this through the cross, that even if they kill me, I'm going to live amongst the land of the living because I have eternal life. So he, this is where he closes with three pieces of advice. The first one he's going to repeat, wait for the Lord. See, many times we want to jump ahead of God. We're going through something, and we're like, oh, I don't know. I can't handle this job anymore. I'm just going to quit. And we quit without praying about it. You're like, man, God's like, man, I was just about to fire your boss, but you ran ahead of me. You didn't wait for me. And what's, there's more in this word wait than just waiting. Okay, well, that's what we do at a doctor's office. This word wait means think of somebody at a restaurant waiting on tables. What are they doing? Are they standing around doing this? They're waiting. They're serving. It really means serve the Lord while you're waiting. It doesn't imply passivity. Do nothing. It means keep serving God even though you're tired. Keep serving God even though you want to quit. Keep serving God even though you don't think you can take it anymore. Just keep serving God. Be strong. Let your heart take courage, which is a choice. Courage is there. you got to choose to take it. And then he repeats himself, keep serving God. That's how you make it through the valleys. And again, Jesus went through all of this on the cross for us. He was in darkness so that you could see the light. He was exposed to danger so that you could be in the fortress of God. He was rejected by men so that you didn't have to worry about what people think of you. And he took upon the wrath of God upon himself so that you would be saved from the wrath that is to come. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the gospel in the Psalms. Thank you for Jesus, who was the prototype of what David was praying. Thank you that we have these psalms that we can pray when our words are so imperfect. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So, hey, I want to have a question and answer time. Yeah, we have time for uh, just a couple. Um, there was a question that was left over from last week that came in on my phone after um, we had already dismissed. And you can ask me a question about anything. It doesn't have to be about um, this, about the message, although it could be about the message. But the question last week, someone texted me. It was the, a friend of theirs invited them to a gay wedding. Do I go? Wow, that's a tough one, isn't it? You, we are experiencing things today that, and our kids are experiencing today that we didn't even think of, think of. And so I could give my opinion but I want to give a biblically-based answer. Amen? Okay? So let me tell you that this is my opinion, but I base it on God's Word. We can agree to disagree. I believe that, that some, a Christian could believe in love that they could go to a wedding and feel like it's God's will. But my opinion is that, no, they should not go. Okay? So if someone chooses to go I, and they do it in love, I'm not going to knock them. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to say book, chapter, and verse says you're wrong because I don't have book, chapter, and verse. I've got some biblical principles. When you have a wedding, you have a best man 
and bridesmaids and bri- and groomsmen and all that stuff, and they are called the people who stand up with you at your wedding. To stand up with somebody meant I'm, I'm endorsing what is happening here today. And to attend a wedding ceremony means I'm endorsing what is happening here today. And so when you attend a wedding, you're not just saying, oh, I'm here for the cake. You're saying, I support what's happening. And because I cannot biblically support a gay marriage, I, as a Christian, will not attend one. I will write them a nice long letter of saying, I love you, I care for you, but I cannot support your decision. That does not mean I hate you. It doesn't mean I'm homophobic. It doesn't mean I'm all these things. I can still have a relationship with you. I can still talk to you when I see you at work, but I can't support your decision. I will continue to pray for you. I will not treat you any different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can even, and someone else, someone, a friend of mine told me that they went, they didn't go to the gay wedding, but they did go to the reception. And you could say that it's a contradiction, and maybe so. But again, the ceremony, attendance is support. Reception, I mean, it's already done. I'm here to say hi and I'm eat, and eat some cake, okay? But we could even squabble about that. But I believe biblically the answer is no, that you, you could not. Um, the other question I've received is about Calvinism. And, I, and this will be the last one. Um, so, because a lot of stuff I listen to and I've even forwarded links to you are by men who believe in what's called Calvinism. And you can read up about it. But Calvinism, basically, the way to remember what they believe is it spells the letter tulip, the word tulip, T-U-L-I-P. T is for total depravity. The man is totally depraved. Now, I believe man's totally depraved, but their definition of total depravity is different. I could hash that out later. Uh, Then the U, I'll skip that. The L that is the big problem I have is what's called limited atonement. Calvinists believe that Jesus died only for the sins of the elect. You know your Bible better than that, right? How many times does the Bible say Jesus died for the sins of the whole world? I believe that means what it says. So how can you say Jesus only died for the elect when the Bible says in multiple places he died for the sins of the whole world? The I in TULIP stands for irresistible grace. That when God draws you to himself, you can't resist, you can't say no. And if God's not drawing you, you can't be saved, which totally erases your choice. I believe the balance is that, yes, God is sovereign and in total control of everything. And at the same time, you have free will and you have choice. That whosoever will may come means whoever wants to can or they can choose not to. And that whole thing about irresistible grace, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. And they were lost. So they resist the Holy Spirit and got lost. And what, but the Calvinists teach that, no, when the Holy Spirit draws you, you can't resist it. It's irresistible grace. And then there's the P, which is perseverance of the saints, which is a whole other topic. So am I a Calvinist? No. Do I believe in sovereignty, predestination, and election? Yes, I do, because they're all in the Word of God. But they, do I also believe in man's free will and his choice? Yes, I do. Do I believe they exist at the same time? Yes. Can I explain that? No. <laughs> is Jesus 100% God? Yes. Is he 100% man? Yes. That doesn't add up mathematically. Yep, I can't explain that. But it's true. So... Is God one? Yes. Is he three persons? Yes. Can you explain that? No. Okay. But I accept. I, can't, I may not be able to comprehend it, but I can apprehend it. Okay. And you can think about the difference there. All right. Let's stand and sing to the Lord.